Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Isn't God good? All the time. Y'all stand up. Everybody stand up. We're going to do our little confession. Confession is good for the soul. Matter of fact, you know, you know, listen, you say, you might not know this, or maybe you do, but do you realize that you talk to yourself every day? Right. You talk to yourself every day. The yeah. problem is a lot of times we say things like, that was stupid. I wish I hadn't done that. Blah, blah, blah. And what it does is it sets you up for bad times. So what you do is you just start saying some positive things to yourself every day. Talk to yourself. Cheer yourself up. Speak positive. That's what the Bible says. Focus on these things. Whatsoever is true, whatsoever is lovely. Focus on these things. This is not some kind of crazy mess. This is the Bible. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do the same thing when we're starting worship. So ready? Now say this together. These are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish them. I am here today to worship, not to be entertained. I am singing to an audience of one, except my worship. Oh Lord, give Lord a hand clap. We're going to do that praise time that we were doing a few weeks ago, where we just sing some choruses. Do you love the Lord this morning? Yeah. There we are. I had to make sure. I had to make sure Betsy was singing here. <laughs> All right. Father, 
We thank you for the time and opportunity to gather in your house today and to worship your name, Lord. And we just ask that you administer a lot of this service today. Let your presence encamp around this place in each and every one of our hearts and bring forth change. Draw us closer unto you, Lord God. And as we draw closer unto you, we just ask you to minister unto each and every one here in their needs, Lord God. You see the situations and you know the problems, Lord, that we all face each and every day. And we just ask you to bring deliverance unto them, Lord God. The testimony will be given. Yeah, I missed one. I sure. 
sure did. Hold on. I missed one, y'all. I'm sitting here. I missed one. It's my fault. Everybody here is still sitting there thinking, this guy, why is he still here? And they're probably thinking, why is he putting this stuff up? <laughs> praise God, praise God. Uh, when you come in today, here's what I want you to do. So that's when we come into church. We come in bringing, bringing every problem, bringing all of our worries, all of our cares. We bring it in and immediately, watch this, this is what's supposed to happen. Immediately, even though you might not walk up here, immediately, symbolically, lay them at the feet of the altar. Then go back to your seat and worship God. Take your mind off what's going on around you. And when you walk out, leave it here. The problem is we come in and we can't hear the service because we're participating because we're still thinking about all these problems. And when these problems are, they will consume you. They will consume you. They will take you down. There are certain people that when they get in trouble, they consume all the air out of the room. Okay? And so what you got to do is you got to bolster yourself. You got to hold on and you got to give it to God and hang on. Okay? So let's go ahead. Remember, today is an awesome day. This is the day the Lord has made. And we're looking for great things to happen. And even though I forgot the last said, I'm glad Eddie said that last week, I forgot communion. Thank you, Eddie. Everybody was just looking at me. Everybody said, hey. <laughs> yeah. All right, ready? It's like the time I had that thing hanging out my mustache. Big old thing hanging out my mustache, hanging out here. Everybody's going to come out just go, look, they're just going. And finally, we got in front of the church. The little girl said, Pastor, what's that in your mustache? I said, I wish they'd ask me that back there somewhere. <laughs> Amen. All right, ready? Now we're going to do it. Ready? Glory, glory. Ready?
Have y'all good? I knew y'all would get it eventually, that's right. Bibles. I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, put one up there for you. 
Brady won't look. <laughs> I love this. Don't stumble over something behind you. Amen. There's one thing to stumble over something in front of you. When you stumble over something behind you, usually the, the, the wreck is a lot worse. Reason is when I stumble forward, at least I can use my hands. When I stumble backwards, I usually hit the back of my head. You know, which is probably the easiest place to hit and not get hurt. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. And I just went ahead and put all that up. This is just a couple, just a couple of slides from last week. Just a couple to bring some continuity. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Stretch forth your hands this way. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I know, God, that you are alive and you are well and you're on the throne. And, Father, we have complete confidence that no matter what the problem is, <clears throat> you know how to fix it. And, Father, I also have complete confidence to know that we don't. And, Father, we have to trust you. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch to minister, to have your will and your way in all of our lives today, God. Let your word be empowered. Let your word make a difference in people's lives. And Father, help us, Lord, put our feet at the foot of the cross and know that that's where our answer starts. It's at the foot of the cross. Not at the top of our brain, but at the foot of the cross is where our problems begin to heal. And we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray in the church. Amen. Amen. Look at somebody and tell them the past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing, and nothing shall be impossible. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <coughs> now, now, Philippians 3 and 13, when it does, what it tells us, it instructs us to focus on the future, not the past. All right? And when it says this one thing I do, it doesn't mean that's all he does. What it means is that's the first thing. It's primary. You can't keep looking over your shoulder all your life. You know, a lot of us find ourselves in a paranoid position where we're always looking over our shoulder expecting our past to catch up with us. Amen? You can't live that way. You can't. If you give it to God, give it to God. If you trust Him, trust Him. It's not an either or. Either you do or you don't. Period. Either you trust Him or you don't. How can I tell if you trust Him or you don't? Period. If you try to fix it yourself, you don't trust Him. Period. We can go home now. If you try to fix everything yourself, or you think you've got enough wisdom and knowledge to fix it yourself, to keep the past from coming up behind you and doing what it's going to do, you're going to fail miserably, and it's going to cause a big bad pain. So one thing I do in order to move forward, I have to let go of the past. There's a perspective here. And that perspective is if my focus is on my past, and my focus is on the pain, then my focus is turned inward. And as long as my focus is turned inward, I will never heal. Never. The only way you're, you can heal is when you're, and this is usually when somebody first gets in a problem, when they first lose a loved one, when they, when they first have these tragedies in their lives, in the beginning of a grieving cycle, their focus is always inward. Always. Always. And when it's inward, all you can see and feel is the pain. And the pain is rough and the pain hurts and it's real and nobody can try to talk you out of it. It's not real. But as time goes by, you learn to focus, turn your focus outward. And as you begin to turn your focus outward, now I can get hope. As long as I focus on the pain, there is no hope. But if I'm focusing outward and upward to God, now I can focus on His problem, I mean on His problem, promise, and I can focus on hope. So now, let's just go through just a couple of slides, like I said, from, from last week. There's the rearview mirror. A lot of us are driving that way, and you can't do a very good job. You can't stay in the middle of the road. You can't stay in your lane. You, know, you, can't, you can't even go to speed you need to go because you're scared you're going to run in the ditch because you're using your rearview mirror. So now, instead of focusing our thoughts and our energies on the opportunities today, we allow painful memories to fill our minds. And when it starts filling our minds, it saps our strength. And it begins to take the air out of us. And I can promise you, when somebody gets oxygen deprived, they don't think clearly. Have you ever, who ever has ever been oxygen deprived? I have. 
And when you've been oxygen deprived, you can't think clearly. Matter of fact, if you stay oxygen deprived long enough, you, you, you can have permanent brain damage. Okay? And so the same way when, when all you can think about is the painful memories of the past and they fill your minds, it zaps our strength. It, it, it takes the air out of us and it can actually call it can shut us down. If you want to shut it down permanently, just keep on thinking about it. But if you can get your mind in another direction, it will not shut you down permanently. So, so we simply can't seem to let go of our pain. And so we just relive that hurt again and again and again with the same, same predictable, predictable consequences. Now, now, I think people say, think sometimes, well, if I just keep thinking about it long enough, it'll change. You have to do positive things to bring change. And just thinking about it, just thinking about it, winds up being a negative thing. Just thinking about it. All it does is replay the pain, replay the pain, replay the pain. So, you have to do something positive to get out of it. So, so it's thank God that God's got other plans. And of course he says, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So now, now again, watch this. <coughs> Folks, and too intently on the past, almost without exception, this is the last slide from last week, it's futile, it's useless, it's hurtful. Watch this, please listen. No amount of anger, no amount of bitterness can change what happened yesterday. It can't. Tears can't change the past. Regrets can't change the past. Our worries can't change the past. Our complaints cannot change the past. The past is the past. It's behind us. You have to learn how to deal with it and leave it behind you. Learn the lessons from it and then move on. Okay? Uh, matter of fact, I want to get, get the Bible. I, I was thinking about something this morning when we up here. Get your Bible up. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4.17. 2 Corinthians 4 and 17. This is, this is so, so, so important. And, and you've got to get this. Because when you get this, I promise you, it will change your day. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 17. Let's just go to verse uh, 16. For which calls me faint not, but though our outward man perisheth, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, now I, I want to just read this again in a couple other of, uh, uh, translations just to get a little clearer understanding of this. Uh, let's see here. We get a, let me get it back here. My fingers. Anybody ever have a problem with your fingers on your cell phone? Okay. For a light momentary affliction. This slight distress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations, a vast and transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. And that's, that's the Greek. That's, that's, that's expounded in the Greek. And this let me give you just a, a homeboy's version. These hard times are small potatoes compared to what's coming with the good times. The lavish celebration prepared for us. Since we consider look not at the things which are seen, uh, but unseen, for the things which are visible are temporal, brief, fleeting, but the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. Of course, the old homeboy. Uh, there's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow, but the things which we cannot see will last forever. Wow. That is so, so powerful. 
is that the stuff that you're going through now, the struggles that you're going through now, God's aware of them. He sees them. He knows it. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you cannot hardly stand. He knows what you're holding on to. He knows what you haven't let go of. He knows what you let go of too soon. He knows what you, you, you held on for too, so, too long. He knows all that. And he knows that in all of this, we're training for stuff coming down the road. And if we can get a grip and understand that God's got this, I mean, really get a grip that God's got this. You know, uh, <clears throat> again, like I was telling y'all before, I told you before, I honestly, because Bethany kept saying, God's got this, God's got this, God's got this. <clears throat> to me, it was just a saying until I watched her go through it. And every, every day, multiple times a day, even when she was near unconscious, she would say, I said, baby, I'm so sorry. I wish I could take this away. And she'd go, don't worry, Dad. God's got this. So this is not a slogan to me. This is life. God's got this. And if we can get that in our mind when we start going through things, instead of losing our mind, we can get even a greater mind of what's going on, a greater consciousness of what's going on, because we could try to fix it ourselves and we let God handle it, okay? So, so let's get back over here uh, with this stuff. So now, look, you're healed when you're no longer mad at the pain, the people, or the problem God used to process you. God's used everything you've gone through to process you to make you a better person, not a, not a worse person, a better person. And so when you're no longer mad at the pain, let me just say it again, the people or the problems God used to process you, then you know you're, you're working toward being healed. So you see, we find ourselves focusing too intently on the past. And it's a sign that we need to focus on moving forward through forgiveness beyond the pain and reaching for a new start. That's what I'm going to talk about today. How, how many could use a new start in certain areas of your life? You could use a fresh start in certain areas of your life. Okay, then, then here we go. Get ready. This is, I'm just going to make an, an acronym from START. Okay, I'm just taking those letters and I'm going to use it, okay? Now, now uh, uh, let's start with number one. We've got a stop sign up there. Number one, Rut Row, Gut Punch, right to start with, right out of the gate, Gut Punch. Stop making excuses. You know, many times we handle life events the way we were trained when we were younger, maybe by our parents or our grandparents or a teacher or something. And because we, we see how they handled it, we grow up thinking that's the way you handle things. And, and uh, my mama was a warrior, not a warrior, a warrior. She got, she got a doctor's degree in worrying. And so to start with, that's how I handled it, by worrying. And then I discovered I didn't have to worry. And so when I didn't have to worry, I could trust God. And then things got better. The same way, and then I began to show Mama. And then Mama, in turn, she became a warrior because she quit worrying and started worrying. Amen. So, so you know, I heard a story about this newlyweds. The newlyweds, you know, they got married and, and she was cooking supper one night. They come home and she said, when you go to the store, did you buy me a ham? So he bought a ham. He brought it home. When we brought it home, uh, they had all these new pans and all this stuff. They had great big pan. And she took that ham and she cut two inches off each side and just laid it to the side. And this great big pan had that ham cut in the middle. And he said, honey, I'm not trying to ask you about your cooking. I'm not trying to think that you don't know what you're doing, but can I ask you a question? She said, sure. He said, you got plenty of room in that pan. Why'd you cut two inches off each side of that ham? She says, I don't know. She said, that's the way my mama used to do it. And he says, you don't know why? He said, I have no idea. She, he says, do you mind if I call her and ask? She says, go ahead, help yourself. I won't be offended. So he calls his mother-in-law and says, can I ask you a question? She said, yes. said, my wife, your daughter, said you're cooking a ham. we got plenty of room in the pan. But she cut two inches off each side of the ham. And she said she did it because that's what she used to do. That's how you handled it. And so 
He said, can I ask you why you cut two inches off each side of your ham? Is it for cooking purposes or what? She says, I have no idea. She said, my mom used to always do that. And she was still living. He said, do you mind if I call Grandma and ask her? And say, oh, you go ahead and call Grandma. So he calls Grandma and says, Grandma, I was sitting here watching my wife cook. And she's cooking a ham and she cuts two inches off each side. she got plenty of room in the pan, but she cut off each side two inches. And said, I asked her, why'd she do that for cooking purposes or why? She said, no, Mama did it that way. So I asked Mama. Mama said, she don't know. You just did it that way. So can I ask you, why did you, why did you, did you used to cut two inches off each side of your ham for you cook? She said, of course I did. He said, can you please tell me why? She said, because my pan was too small. It wouldn't hold the ham. I had to cut two inches <laughs> off each side so the pan would hold it. Let that sink in. Sometimes we're doing things that makes absolutely no sense. We handle pain in some crazy ways. We handle the past in some crazy ways because we were either trained that way or we came up thinking that's how to handle it. And I'm here today to tell you, no, it's not. And again, again, don't make excuses why you can't move past the pain. Making excuses. My well, friend, just do this. I'll show you this. <clears throat> Just a few little nice little quotes. A man good at making excuses is seldom good at anything else. The Benjamin Franklin. Of course, if you look at any, any quote comes from two different people, who are they? Benjamin Franklin and who? Abraham Lincoln? There he is. <laughs> excuses are the nails that build a house of failure. There's only two options. Make progress or make excuses. You know, a uh, uh, guy was fishing, and he came up on another guy who wanted to go fishing. He goes to the pond, and he sees this guy fishing. And when he goes fishing, when this guy's catching these cradle big bass, and when he catches these bass, he would take it. He had a little rod, a little seven-inch rod. He put it up against that fish, and he just kept noticing if it was over seven inches, he threw it back. He was catching great old big bass. He was thinking, I can't believe he's catching these big bass and throwing them back. He's looking, if they're over seven inches, he throws them back. I can't believe it. And so finally he said, sir, I don't mean to meddle, but can I ask you a question? He says, yes. He says, I've seen you catch some, some 12 inch, some 15 inch, 18 inch bass. You're throwing them all back. You measure me, throw them back. And all you're holding on to is those seven inch, that little thing right there, the seven inches. You're holding on to a seven inch bass while you're throwing away all the good stuff. Why, pray tell, can you tell me why you keep throwing back all the big bass and keeping the seven inch bass? He said, it's very simple. He said, all I got is a seven inch pan. When you make excuses, all you got is a seven inch pan. Amen? You can't heal. Look somebody said we can't heal. Tell somebody. We can't heal. All right. So, number one, stop making excuses. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. If they did it better, we'd be okay. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's that, that, blah, 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 blah. And all we do when we make excuses is we're placing blame and we keep the fingers away from us. We're pushing the fingers away. Blame, 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 blame. Make excuses. Stop it. Stop it. There's no such thing as all blame on one side. Blame has an arrow on both ends. Okay? Always has an arrow on both ends. So, here we go. Now we're in the yield sign. Take an inventory of your life. I bet you, if you take an inventory of life, you're going to see things a little bit different because when you're thinking, when you're upset, you're not thinking. When, when, when you're, you're exhausted because of this problem just keeps hitting, 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 you stop thinking. And one of the most dangerous things in the world is to stop thinking when you need to be thinking. You need to evaluate all your assets, all your abilities, and all your experiences. If you're experiencing a loss right now, you ain't got to raise your hand, but while you're thinking about that loss, here's what I want you to do. I want you to evaluate everything. And then watch this. After you evaluate your assets, your abilities, and your experiences, what's left over after you've discarded what needs to be left behind, that's what you want to hang on to. Okay? We get so busy focusing on what we lost that we lose sight of what we have and even gain. Is that biblical? Paul thought so. Paul said you've experienced many things. Are all those experiences wasted? I hope not. That's not David Linton. That's not Sigmund Freud. That's Paul the Apostle. You've been through a lot. 
Are you going to waste it? Wow. Don't slick at anybody else. Just right now, I just want you to look up. But nobody, you know, you can say it to yourself or say it out loud. Thank you, God. Say it, say it out loud so I'm here. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That you never waste pain. Say it again. Thank you, God, that you never waste my pain. Amen. All right. So get ready. So here, here's the challenge. Make you three columns. This is do it on your own. You don't have to have anybody else do this with you. Just do it on your own. If you're suffering a loss right now, if you're suffering some crazy mess, make three columns. And each column, one column put lost, the other, pop, the other column put kept, the other column put gained. Now you can take a proper inventory. Yes, you know, like with Beth, yes, we lost Bethany. Yes, it was a loss. But we kept some, some powerful, powerful life lessons, including turning this slogan, God's got this, into something very powerful that I live by every day now. God's got this. I had somebody just last couple weeks, last few days, how can he be so calm? How can you be so calm over this? How can you? And I, and I say, this is not a cliche. God's got this. I can get up and jump around and run and snort and holler and hoot and hand, handy and all that, but you know what? Why can't I just keep my composure and know that God's got this? You think when I get crazy, it's going to get his attention better? No. Matter of fact, you, you, your faith is diminished by that time because fear is taking over. And when you get a hold of fear, guess what? You don't, whose attention you don't get? God's. It's faith that gets his attention. Fear is the opposite of faith. So now, out to proper inventory, see how things really look. Yes, we lost Bethany, a precious soul, but we kept some, we kept some things that she told us, and what I have gained is it's no longer a slogan. It is my life, my life verse, side, slogan. God's got this. Either way, I win. And I know that. I know that more and more all the time, especially when I get a little, every time I get a little bit older, and it's only a little bit older, I don't get a lot older, I just get a little bit older. All right, and it's good stuff. Okay. <laughs> now, the green light, ready? Now you can move forward. So now, here's how you move forward. Ready? I want you to know something, I'm going to tell you ahead of time. It may take a while to move forward. You may even feel stuck. Let me just tell you something. Pain. Pain comes in three dimensions. Number one, pain can become mud to you and it keeps you stuck. Number two, pain can be quicksand to you and you just keep sinking. Or, pain can be a launching pad. Learn the lessons and soar. There he is, one more time. Pain can be mud. You just keep stuck. You never can go forward in life anymore because you're stuck in that pain. But if they hadn't done this, if I hadn't done that, if they had blah, 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 and you're stuck in the pain. Number two, now is when it really gets rough. Being stuck is not such a great emotional distress. But now when it becomes quicksand, now you're in distress. And now you find yourself sinking. Or you can look at it as now, this pain has put you on the launching pad. Learn the lessons and soar like an eagle from what you learn. So, so you may feel stuck. Let me just tell you something. You can't go by feelings. The Bible tells us the feelings are deceitful. Your heart is deceitful. Jeremiah says your heart is deceitful. You can't go by your heart. Because Jeremiah said, God, you've deceived me. I had all these big plans in the ministry. I had everything all figured out, God. And now I've ministered for 20 years and don't have one convert. You've deceived me. I let you pull the wool over my eyes, God. I wish I would never listened to you. Wow. That's Jeremiah. Again, like Paul, a very powerful man. But the first half of his ministry was very fruitless. So, so, so again, you can't go, he said, so Paul, so, so, so Jeremiah wrote, you can't go by your feelings, you got to trust God in all of this. Matter of fact, he wound up getting put, put in a cistern, thinking that they were doing him wrong by putting him in the cistern, but when they put him in the cistern, when the enemy attacked, they didn't see him, because he was hid. 
Sometimes you think that you're in a cistern, you're in a cesspool, you're in a septic tank and say, God, when are you going to let this septic tank be released so I can get out of it, not knowing that it's actually protecting you? Like it protected Jeremiah. All in perspective. So you can't go by feelings that it requires hope, faith, and courage. Watch this. Therefore, if any man is, is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, the new has come. I keep looking over my shoulder. I keep reliving the past. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you what happens is, get ready. I know this might not be too happy a thing to hear, but I'm going to tell you anyway. If all you keep doing is reliving your past, it becomes nothing more than, listen, you become spiritual lazy. Because now you've got a reason why you don't want to try. Because look what they've done to me. I don't have to try. Look at what they've done to me. Look at what they did. Look at what I did. I don't even have to try anymore. I'm just going to sit here and wallow because of what they did to me. And you become spiritually lazy, which in turn becomes mentally and emotionally lazy. Let your eyes look directly forward. Look at this. And your gaze be straight before you. Who did that? Of course, that's this David, I mean, uh, uh, Solomon talking. But, but, but who, who, who did that? Weren't it Jesus? When he knew that he was going to be crucified, he knew it was going to be bad, he knew it was going to be whipped, but the Bible said he said, his face like a flint. Wow. That's what it's talking about. It looked directly forward. He said, his face like a flint. He said, I've got to go to Jerusalem. So, so I move forward, and I hope this stuff is really helping, because I, I, know, it's, I know that it's helped me over the years. I'm not telling you anything that I don't do all the time. Then I want you to act in faith. We need to look up and look out and launch out into new territory. Explore. You know, it's amazing how God can be working in your life and you don't even know it. You don't even see it because you're so busy looking this way or so busy doing this that you can't see the new windshield right in front of you. And you're missing out on all God's doing for you because you're doing this or you're doing this. And all it does is compound the pain. We don't need, I mean, if we don't grow and move ahead, we're going to get stagnant. Okay? The key to changing anything is faith. If we want to change our circumstances, it's going to take faith. What I have discovered is our past can hold us hostage. But not only can our past hold us hostage, past pain can not only hold you hostage, but hold everybody around you hostage. I'll let that one sink in. And let me give you an example. Have you ever been in a grocery store and somebody's coming up to talk to you and you're thinking, here we go again. I know I'm the only one that's ever done that. I'm a heathen. Here we go again. All I'm going to hear about is blah, 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 blah. And after about a third time, watch this. I see him coming and I go, Why? Because they suck the air out of the room everywhere they go because all they can do is do this. And all it does, it doesn't bring any healing. All it brings is pain. It compounds the pain. You know, uh, anything that's stale or stagnant, water, if you have water that's stale or stagnant, not a living spring, but a stale or stagnant water like a mud hole, how many's ever been to, to low land in mosquito season? We used to have to put we used to have to put put uh, heavy duty windshield wipers on our on the on, I used to work at Lee's TV in Western all day. We had to put heavy duty windshield wipers on the car on the van, and we had to put an extra screen on the grill to, to keep mosquitoes out of it, of the radiator, and be able to pop them up. It would take it would take three people to do a two man antenna job. One to put the antenna up, the oven to open, hand in the tools, and the third one to beat the mosquitoes off the other two guys. And you ride through. Low land, you remember, because it is low, and because it's got these great old big channels of water on both sides, when you ride by, you can see the mosquitoes just breeding. They're everywhere. I mean, it's, it's terrible to see what's going on. You know why? Because that water's stagnant. Okay? Anything that's stagnant in your life becomes a breeding ground for all types of parasites. For all types of sickness and disease, Physically, 
mentally, emotionally. Honestly, sometimes we go to the doctor because we've got pains and not realizing the pain is because we have unforgiveness. The pain in our back. The pain in our jaw. The headache. is because we have unforgiveness. Not because any people can change it. They can mask the pain, but they can't fix it. It takes an encounter with God and forgiveness to move past the past, to take care of that pain. So act in faith. Then refocus. I need to refocus my thoughts if I want to change my life. Proverbs 24 and 23 says, Keep vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. In other words, in your mind. In your mind. My life doesn't start out there. My life starts here because here's where I'm going to choose either the rearview mirror, looking by the past, or looking through the, looking through the windshield. I'm almost through. Some of y'all are saying, please hurry up. You already got a green light, just go, please. Go. All right, get ready. And it's good stuff. Amen. Um, two of you think so. The rest of you are going. <laughs> ready? <laughs> well, you know what? what, what and this is one of those things that you're not shouting because you can't shout, because it meets you where you're at. That's what God does. He meets us where we're at. Every time. The difference is not does he meet us where we're at. He gives us a choice to stay where we're at or hop in and ride with him. Kind of like this. You're thumbing. You're thumbing in the rain. Now, I'm going to tell you, poor Bethany, when she started driving, nobody ride with her but me. And I just had a hit on collision. I already had a PTSD from that hit on collision. I was the only one to ride with Bethany. I'd, I'd pray every time we would get going. I remember one time, look, one time there was a guy when they were building 17 out there by Possum Track. It took them forever. And the guy's out there with a flag trying to flag everybody down. And Bethany comes up. And the guy is doing this. Bethany's not stopping. So he starts doing this. I'm saying, stop, Bethany, stop. And she speeds up. And bless that poor man's heart. He took his little flag and started doing this. Next thing I know, he just stopped and went. And she stopped right at his feet. I said, girl, get out of the car. Get out of the car. Let me drive. She said, you want me to get back in? I said, no, just let me drive by myself. You walk. <laughs> one, one day, one day, you know, it was raining and snowing. And a poor man had a, a little light jacket on. He had it up around his neck. He's about to freeze to death. He's stumbling. You can see his hand doing and he sees Bethany coming down the road and he goes. <laughs> you know what? Some of us are thumbing right now and don't even realize it because we're not on the road. Because we've been looking in the rearview mirror. And looking at the rearview mirror, we've already crashed. And we're about to burn. And you're thumbing. And God stopped by, opened the door and said, come on, get in. I'll, I'll take you where you need to go. I'll show you a better way. Come on, let me show you. And you're going, uh, no, nah, I want to thumb a little bit longer. I want to find somebody that I can, I can convince I'm right. Why well, convince God you're right? Try. So here we go. Watch this. Get ready. I'm just through. Trust. That's your tea. Trust God to help you succeed. Depend on Him, not yourself. We've already proven that we can't do it on our own. How many here can do it on your own? Don't raise your hand. Can't do it on my own. That's why we fail. We can't change who, what, when. Only God can do that. Giving God control of my life is what He wants. It's Isaiah 26. And I like this too. Uh, uh, with Isaiah, get, get your Bibles again. Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. I'll get it. Hold on. 
Holy Spirit, I'm getting there. There we go. Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26 and 4 says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. The King James says, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for the Lord, Jehovah, is everlasting strength. Now, take it up one verse. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts. In thee. I suppose if God's got this, was to have a scripture to go along beside it, that would be it. That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted thee. I know I told you this a hundred times, but I just got to tell it now because y'all, some of you may not have heard it. As a pastor, I've been around a lot of people that somebody said they never complained and never complained, and I go, well, I don't tell anybody, I don't tell them a soul, I don't tell a soul, but I just go, well, I know I heard them, but that's because they could let it, they felt like they could let me try to help. So I know that most of the time there is something usually complaining. But I can tell you, not just because she's my daughter, or our daughter, is this. She never, ever, in my presence, complained. But I do remember Wednesday before she died on Saturday. I do remember Wednesday she had been unconscious for most of the day. And I'd made to check on Linda because Linda had the blood clots in her, in her lungs. And so she was home resting. She just got home from being in the hospital for several days with blood clots in her lungs. And I come by and DC said, Dad, she ain't talked all day. I said, okay. And so I laid in the chair beside her so I could hear. I didn't use my sleep machine. I just wanted to hear her if she needed me. I lay beside her. She hadn't talked all day. And I hear her. She goes, Dad. 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 And I said, What, Bethany? And she said, I think I'm scared. That's it. I think I'm scared. And I got up. And I walked over toward her. And I kissed her on the forehead. And I took her by the hand. And I said, dear, it's okay to be scared because dad's scared too. I said, well, we know why. God's got this. And she said, yes. And she's all right back to sleep. God has got this. you got to believe him. So, so here we go. Yeah, I'm going to throw this is going to be quick. Really, really quick. This is, <laughs> I love this. This is real scriptural. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's not try to mess it up. <laughs> well, let's try not to mess it up. Let's try to get ready. This, y'all say it with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's try not to mess it up. Okay. So get ready. Here we go. How, how can we do this? I just told you about trust. I mean, about, about start. Now watch this. Three things you can do with mistakes and hurts. Number one, and I'll be quick about it so we can get out of here. Resolve never to make another mistake or be hurt again. What's the line underneath it? That is impossible. <laughs> How many years made your mind up? I'm never going to make another mistake and I'm never going to be hurt again. You can put that on, you can have that one in, when God puts your comedy hour up in heaven. I'm never going to make another mistake. I'm never going to be hurt again. That is impossible. If you're living, you're going to make a mistake. And if you, and you're going to be hurt again. Even if you put, cut everybody out of your life, everybody out of your life, you're going to be hurt. 
Can I say that loud enough? Even if you cut everybody out of your life, you're still going to get hurt. It's impossible to think it's not going to happen again. Or you can retreat. Let mistakes and hurts make a coward of you. That's foolish. You can't run far enough to get away from mistakes and hurt. You can't. Or you can rebound. Learn from your mistakes. Move forward with your hurts. This is profitable. One more, one more scripture. We've got to go to these scriptures. And then, then I'm going to going to end this thing. Turn to Josh, I mean to uh, Genesis. Get your Bible out. Turn to Genesis. Genesis 41. This is good stuff. Genesis 41. Genesis 41. Just stop at uh, verse 50. Park right there for a minute. Verse 50. Park right there. Let me ask you a question. How many remember the story of Joseph? Young man who really thought he was going places, and he sure did. He got, he got sold into slavery. When he got sold into slavery by his brothers, who he thought would love him to be a safe place, he wound up getting sold into slavery. Uh, but they figured that was better than killing him. And when he gets sold into slavery, he goes to Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife comes on him and tries to, to uh, have sex with him. And he kept refusing and refusing, and she couldn't stand it. So she finally, as he ran, she tore his coat, and then she accused him of rape. He winds up going to prison for something he didn't do. And after he's there seven plus years, the baker and the butler are in there and he says what y'all in here for and they told him and, and they and so he gets to know them and they have a dream and in the dream they come up to to uh, Joseph and Joseph tells them their dreams one of them's going to be released in three days the other one's going to be killed in three days that's exactly what happened when the butler was released who stood right by Pharaoh's side all the time said when I get out I'm going to tell Pharaoh and get you out of here when he got out he forgot for another two more years so this man's going to spend ten some think maybe 13 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. But instead of getting tough with God, he trusted God. And then Pharaoh had a dream, and the butler remembered it and told Pharaoh. And Pharaoh called in Joseph, and Joseph had the dream, gave him the interpretation of the dream. And then one day he went from the very bottom. The Bible said in, in Psalms that, that he, had, he had scars on his ankles from the shackles that he had on him all the time. And one day, Joseph went from the very bottom of the pit to the palace, second in charge. Only Pharaoh was more powerful than him. And so, he marries Pharaoh's daughter. And so what happens is, as he, as he, gets, when he gets married, Joseph was born two sons. Watch this. Actually, the daughter of the priest, not, not Pharaoh, but the daughter of the priest. Okay, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Why did Joseph pick a crazy name like Manasseh? His name is firstborn son. After 10, 13 years in prison, being beat all the time, uh, being in prison, being falsely accused of rape, all this stuff going on, he's had 10 years of his life taken away from him. All this stuff. But he calls his first son Manasseh. Manasseh means for God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Manasseh means you help me forget my pain in the past. Then he has another son. Verse 52, and the name of the second was called Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Ephraim means double fruit. So what happens is God took his pain and gave him something very powerful, powerful from it. So BJ, come on up here. <coughs> Simply put, yesterday ended last night. The past is always going to be the past. You can't change it. It'll be the past forever. But the Lord says, forget what happened before and do not think about the past. Look at the new thing I'm going to do. 
It's already happening. Don't you see it? I will make a road in the desert and rivers in the dry land. Everybody stand. Life is not easy. It's never been easy. If you think you have an easy life, just go ahead and hold on because it's coming. It's lined with pain. It's lined with problems. Life is lined with hurts. And we just talked about it. You can't retreat from it. You can't say, I'm not going to have any more pain. It's not going to happen. You can't say, I'm going to run from it. You can't. Pain is a part of life. But God uses that pain for us to grow. That we can help others. Corinthians says, you need to take, take you, you comfort others with the same comfort that you received. When you're going through your pain, the stuff that helped you, now you use it to help somebody else. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. Everybody's eyes closed. I want to ask. Is there anybody out here that would be bold enough to say, Pastor, I'm dealing with some past pain. And matter of fact, it's present with me right now. I can't run away from it. And I need help. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. I can't get rid of it. I'm glad you're here this morning because God's got the remedy. Not you. God has. If you're here and you say, I'm dealing with some past pain. <clears throat> I deal with it every day. <clears throat> it hurts. And I need God to help me with nobody looking around. Nobody looking around. Would you put that hand up and say, I got some past pain that I really, really, really need to help with. Maybe you're here today. We're going to be bold again. Hands went up everywhere. Bold again. Maybe you're here today. I'll leave it 
it with you. I leave it with you. Is at the altar. Is at the altar. And nothing. And nothing. And nothing. And nothing. Is better, is better than giving it to you. Giving it to you. I release my responsibility. Release my responsibility. I'm trying to fix it myself. Trying to fix it myself. And I give it to you. Give it to you. In the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Now, also, the altars are open. If you need to pray for anything, you want to talk to God about anything, the altars are open. If you want new life, the altars are open. If you want Jesus, the altars are open. It's here. It's available. And it's ready for you. In the name of Jesus.